Hello boys and girls, welcome to the Roaming Startup Show. I am Professor Hans von Puppet. Today, Bob and Zach visit with Fred Hicks about his new game, Fate Core. He's funding it on Kickstarter. What a surprise. Listen as Fred explains how he tortured his wife during the creation. Thank you, Professor, and welcome everybody to another episode of The Roaming Startup. We're here with Fred Hicks talking about his game Fate Core. Thanks for joining us, Fred. Absolutely happy to be here, man. And as always, I've got Bob here. Bob, how's it going? Uh, Zach, going real well. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to this particular interview. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Fred's work all the way back to, uh, for years now, he's been working on the Dresden file stuff, and I really like that whole series. So I'm really looking forward to chatting with him today. Well, Fred, why don't you tell us about your project that's currently on Kickstarter? Sure. We've kind of teased our, our fans for years that we were going to put out a update to our the role-playing game system that we've used for Spirit of the Century and the Dresden Files role-playing game. That's not exaggeration. It's been, it's been years. We're like, okay, we're going to get this one done, and then we're going to get the next one done, and finally we're going to get this system without all the setting stuff uh, out to you. And that promise happened in 2006 for Spirit of the Century and 2010 for the Dresden Files role-playing game. So there's been a bit of build-up of demand for it. And uh, in the process of like sitting down and making sure that we were sort of ground up, writing down the, the system in the clearest way possible, we realized that we were kind of headed into a new edition. So all, all that waiting was was good. Uh, Fate Core, which is how we're referring to the Fate Core system book, it's been a while coming, but it is really the sort of the clearest, strongest, unlike how I talk, uh, the clearest, strongest uh, version of the uh, Fate system we've gotten together yet. And with our Kickstarter, we decided to do a few slightly unusual things. First off, we set it to the maximum time length, which they tell you never to do because we wanted you to we wanted people to be able to use the 60 day span to really explore the game and play test it and that goes to the second thing what we do is the the moment you pledge any amount and this is essentially your promise of money gets you this you're able to get to a backers only post and download the full laid out but without the art yet draft of the game for just you know even just pledging at a buck people seem to like that <laughs> it, it's not just pledging just a buck. The thing I found so interesting about it is it's really betting on the come line. Because if you hadn't met your, your goal, mm -hmm. those would have all been out there free, which was, a, I thought, just a great way to sure. involve your audience. I mean, we did lowball our target a bit because really when it came down to it, we knew that we were going to be printing the game. So we decided, okay, we're not going to we're not gonna let the writing costs that we've already spent be a part of the, the funding target. We're not going to let the printing cost because you know, we're, we know we're going to do that anyway. But let's see how much we can do in the way of at least funding the art budget side of things. So that's what we built our uh, initial target of $3,000 around. And like I said, there was some built up demand. So people hit that in the first 15 minutes. <laughs> and we had planned about 12 stretch goals. We, I mean, we knew a few more beyond that, but we knew, okay, we got these, these 12 stretch goals. They should last us Hopefully, at least the first week, or you know, maybe maybe a little bit longer. Yeah, 25 hours later, all 12 of those structures. <laughs> yeah, we knew there was some built-up demand, but we hadn't quite figured on how much there was. It's, it's let's a good take kind a of surprise, but <laughs> let's let's take just a second and take a look at the video from Kickstarter real quick. Sure. sure. Hi, this is Paul Tevis for Evil Hat Productions, bringing you a message from company co-founder Fred Hicks. Hey there, Kickstarters. This is Fred Hicks from Evil Hat Productions, and I'm here to talk to you about Fate Core. Uh, Fate Core is the latest iteration of the Fate System. Uh, the Fate System was really Evil Hat's first role-playing game that we published over 10 years ago. Uh, we've been working on Fate in one form or another ever since. You may be familiar with Fate in games like Spirit of the Century and the Dresden Files role-playing game that we published. Uh, as well as uh, other incarnations published by other companies. Uh, with Fate Core, our rules are clearer and stronger than they've ever been before. Uh, we've dug down into the core of Fate uh, and fine-tuned the engine to where it hums. Uh, simply put, Fate Core is the 
best version of faith that we can possibly make right now. By backing this Kickstarter, you'll help Evil Hat move Fate Core through the final stages of production and publication. Best of all, the game is pretty much already done. Uh, the moment you back the project at any level, you'll get access to an exclusive backers-only update post uh, that lets you look at a complete laid-out text of the game. Uh, there are just two things missing from Fate Core right now, and that's the interior art and your feedback. Uh, we'll be using the money that you contribute uh, to fund the game's art needs. Uh, but more importantly, uh, during the intentionally longer Kickstarter campaign that we're running here, uh, we're going to be listening to your input as a reader and as a playtester as we continue to polish the game. In essence, what you say to us during this Kickstarter campaign will shape the final form of Fate Core, which we'll then be using to power the upcoming Atomic Robo role-playing game, as well as other games down the line. Uh, along the way, you'll also uh, have an opportunity to reach for stretch goals that expand what Fate Core does, uh, what it has to offer in the form of electronic supplements uh, covering new worlds and new ways to use the system as well. We'll announce all of those over the course of the project as it continues. This is an exciting time for Fate, an exciting time for Evil Hat, and we're thrilled to invite you to come along on this Kickstarter experience with us. We hope you'll join us. Thanks. And we're back. Okay, so Fred, as I understand it, this whole system originated in a car ride? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Rob and I have terribly, deeply geeky conversations. And, yeah, we were, this was some amount of time ago. Um, <laughs> this is while we were uh, briefly living out in California. And uh, we were on a drive back from Lake Tahoe. And my wife really wanted to hang out with me. So she was in the car with me and Rob. And then the conversation started. <laughs> if geek has a stink... <laughs> This one was a bad stench, huh? Yes. So uh, ultimately, I was concerned that we were driving her deeper and deeper into the sparing depths of boredom and asked her, you know, Deborah is in the other car, Rob's wife. Deborah is in the other car. You could have a perfectly lovely, normal human <laughs> conversation with her because Rob and I, frankly, are not going to stop. <laughs> and yeah, in retrospect, I feel pretty bad about that, but that conversation, you know, explored all sorts of areas that we had been intending to take the system after the first time I had run a game based on Roger Zelazny's Amber uh, Universe in Fudge. And there were some good ideas there, but we wanted to make them better. And that whole car ride was that conversation, and what came out on the other side of that was uh, sort of uh, version zero of Fate. And based on that, I mean, you would think these stretch goals would be a cake for you to come up with. What, do you need another 30 or 40? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've lost track. I, I think we're into the 20s in terms of numbers that we put out there by this point. After the first 12 were hit, I think we got another, I want to say four or five out there that were like interesting setting and stuff. And we also got some things in there like because we've written the system from the ground up for Fate Core, we're able to do more than one license if we want to because we're not borrowing any material from like prior open gaming license sources that would obligate us to only use the open gaming license. So one of the stretch goals was, well, if you wanted it available in Creative Commons too, we can do that. And we've also gotten some upgrades to the physical form of the the Fate Core book. It's going to be in hardcover now for the exact same price that we're going to have it in uh, softcover because we can take the size of the print run up to the point where the price points are going to be equivalent. And a few other things like that. And we've got a, uh, a thing that I'm not going to tell you about. Oh, come on. Um, <laughs> Uh, not not if this is streaming anywhere because uh, that information goes out Tuesday. But we've got a bigger uh, thing. That was, once we got past <laughs> very rapidly all of the expansions that we were, uh, you know, definitely planning and putting on there. And we're just talking like short little expansions, about ten thousand, fifteen thousand words. That's the range for each of them. We're like, okay, well, it'll take a while, but maybe we should start making the next stretch goals about putting things onto Evil Hat's docket for the next you know, like year and a half. Like, okay, what's a big project that we could promise um, if we hit a certain level, if we had the, like the development budget to say, okay, we, we can actually 
uh, afford to put a bunch of our writers off in a you know a room somewhere with this word count budget or whatever and and start developing this new thing so that's the shape at least I can tell you of what we're going to be talking about on Tuesday something we've hinted at before and I think a few people have guessed it already but uh, I want to want to save for the surprise <laughs> So uh, tell us a little bit about your relationship with Harry Dresden, man. Oh, that son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Harry, back when, let's see, this was before I really knew Rob um, that well. In the time between the end of my uh, undergrad at University of Florida and my arrival in Maryland to start on a whole startup, it's the 90s there's a bubble, but we haven't popped it yet, fun time. I lived out in Oklahoma for a little bit over a year, thinking that I was going to get a graduate degree and then discovering I had no temperament for graduate work. <laughs> While I was out there, one of the things I've been doing a lot during my uh, undergrad years was mushing. And if you don't know what a mush is, it's a multi-user shared hallucination, that's the clever little acronym, that uh, was for essentially these online chat room type things, but they were structured such that they had elements of an environment, like there were rooms, you could travel to rooms, you could, and of course, role players flocked to this, and there was uh, one of them, again, based on Roger Zelazny's Amber series called Amber Mush, and one of the guys I knew on there, uh, named Jim, was going to the University of Oklahoma Norman in their uh, uh, professional fiction writing instructional track, whatever the heck, the heck that's called, and that was about a, what was it, an hour, hour and a half south of me, so he said, come on down on the weekends and we'll play, you know, uh, I'm running a birthright game, you can show up for that, we can watch Babylon 5 and all that stuff, and it was good. And one of the projects he was working on was a novel called Semi-Auto Magic, which you would know as Stormfront. That was the one of his class projects at the time. I still remember, this is going to date it, this is going to date it, the sound of it printing out on a dot matrix printer. Oh boy. <laughs> during, <laughs> during one of my visits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's the sound of magic happening. Yeah, so it took him a while to get that sold, but when it did, I'm like, Jim, I am here for you. Let's make a fan site happen before your book actually gets published. And I started up a, a website to kind of support that. I had a mailing list going for, uh, uh, for people who had you know, gotten early exposure to it or, or had known him through some of his online activities before. And that grew and grew and grew until it essentially became his official website. So I've kind of been embedded in the in sort of the background in the gym support arena, uh, uh, pretty much from the the start of him becoming Jim himself. It, part of the reason of our interest in that all, and uh, you may not be aware, uh, we're based out of Independence, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're not too far from him. No, from my house, I can throw a rock and hit Jim's house. Question for you: How did the whole Dresden role playing game start then for you? Was that something you did collaboration or what? It, it was it was bizarre because you know it was not in my realm of. We weren't even a Evil Hat wasn't even a professional commercial company of any sort at the time. Um, when we got the license, Rob and I had just we had put a, a version of Fate out there for free. Because it was, in our mind at the time, just a hack of the fudge system, and the community was very much about, okay, I'm, I'm doing a thing here, put it out there. And we decided that, you know, we, we at least knew a little bit about layout, so we had spruced it up a bit, made it look nice for a, for a downloadable PDF of that era. And it got a little bit of attention, won a few awards at the, uh, the Indie RPG Awards, which was great and completely unexpected. Right around that time, or so I'm told, Jim was having a conversation with his agent, Jennifer Jackson, who's also a gamer. And uh, they were talking about um, you know, various licensing uh, deals that had come to them uh, for the Dresden Files, and one of the things was for a role-playing game. A few, a few different companies had asked about it. And Jim was like, I, I don't know. I, I'm a gamer in my blood. I, I need this to be good, and I don't know that I trust anyone I don't know. And Jennifer said, you know, don't you have a few friends who are these award-winning award winning game designers? And he said, huh, yeah. So I got a phone call out of the blue. And Jim, he's just this guy, you know? And he uh, offered us the license. And, you know, it took a while to gather my wits back together at that point. I remember staring at the ceiling. At this point, you don't even have a company to take the license. Yeah, I mean, we, we, Evil Hat existed in, in name because... Uh, that was kind of a, a brand under which we would go to conventions like Ambercon Northwest and run some scenarios. 
you know, I'd had the idea that if we branded our scenarios as an evil hat production, people wouldn't have to remember the names of the GMs from that good time they'd had before. But the name evil hat would likely grab into, your, into the brain. That's kind of why I liked it. So that just was the natural fit for what we would name the company once we were, uh, you know, ready to go and uh, become a, you know, a real boy. And that was late 2005, somewhere around then. Maybe it was, maybe it was earlier than that. I don't really want to contemplate that it being earlier than that. But regardless, uh, like a complete newbie, I went and announced the license right away because we were going to have a game super fast. And you'll notice that the publication date of that was 2010. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it doesn't take any time at all. No, no, no time at all. But yeah, I mean, the, 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 everything that proceeded from there was sort of the process of realizing, oh, in order to be the company that can publish the Dresden Files role-playing game, we need to become it. We need to go through all these steps. We need to make our mistakes and not with this huge, potentially flagship kind of property. So Spirit of the Century kind of happened as a side effect of the effort to do that. And, oh God, then this shield bracelet. The shield bracelet, I think, ate a year of developer thought time to try to figure out the right way to get that to, to, to work in things. And, you know, the, the, the problem is, is you continue to work on an actual living series every flipping year, Jim wrote another book. And uh, yeah, so that left us going, oh, hmm. Harry can do that now, huh? Yeah, by the time you catch up, Harry's, uh, Harry's grown gills. Yeah, whatever, right. I mean, he's, he's farting fire and flying through outer space, whatever. It was difficult for us to keep up. And that just extended the thing. And of course, somewhere in the middle of that, like post our getting the license, Pre us finally getting around to freaking publishing it, the property continued to grow, continued to blow up. The James Marsters started reading the audiobooks. That got uh, that fandom right, and then the television series started and got canceled. It had its whole run during the development pr process, and you know at each time the fan base was ticking larger and larger. And I knew because, like I said, on the other side, I'm running Jim's fan site, right? And I'm like, oh, that's a lot of traffic. So you know there was a mix of performance anxiety, but a lot of it was just this series keeps growing and we need to have we need to design a game that is faithful to it does well by our friend and grows naturally with the series such that we could just point at the new novel and say you can probably figure out in game terms what happened there and so far people have told us that at least they're you know getting i don't know an 80 percent success rate with that so that it may be better so uh that's good that's good do you still run the campaign yourself do you run a campaign <laughs> I have kids. I don't have campaigns. I was going to say, how do you have time? <laughs> I, I don't really. Yeah, I mean, that's the, it's sort of the, the sad truth of becoming a game publisher is that you often find yourself not playing as much as you used to. But I think that alone wouldn't have <laughs> killed off a lot of the gaming in my life if I hadn't then gone and said, oh, I want to re really want to have kids. But oh my god, my kids are so awesome. They're just not really accommodating when you want to do the. <laughs> I want to burn my entire Saturday pretending I'm someone else. Right. See how that goes for you. And that is surely no trouble whatsoever. <laughs> so uh, how did you come up with the idea to allow a beta test uh, during the campaign? Uh, it seems brilliant. I just kind of committed myself in a lot of ways to a very transparency-oriented posture with Evil Hat from the get-go, in part because it was so flippin' difficult to find any information about what was reasonable to expect for any of the 5,000 things that you need to know in order to publish games when I started out. And I'm like, well, if I, you know, speak out loud all the lessons and, you know, the, the sales figures and all of the stuff, someone else is going to come along and see that and think, I can do that too, and now I actually have the flippin' information to do it. So there's always been this kind of notion for Evil Hat in all of its things, not just stuff that was available through the OGL like uh, the Open Gaming License like uh, Fate was, of, of really just embracing our, our fans, treating them as our peers, and we started this before the, the phrase crowdsourcing became a, a kind of a buzz-tastic phrase, or even existed, and but we've always had this kind of crowdsourced, take it to the people, get their feedback, ask them to help catch our typos. I mean, you know, what have you. Even with uh, the 2006 pre-order of Spirit of the Century, we had set it up such that people would, the moment they placed their pre-order for a book that was intended to ship two to three months later, 
they would get PDF immediately upon placing the pre-order. And that's when we stumbled into crowdsourcing. That's when we found out, oh, we're getting a bunch of feedback and we haven't actually sent this to the printer yet. We can fix this. <laughs> and it worked out really great and it made Spirit of the Century a more solid product before it got out the door. So we did that again with the Dresden Files role-playing game. Had the pre-order, had at least a you know, two, three month hang time and people got the PDF right away and they asked us all sorts of questions, you know, want to clarify this, hey, there's a typo over there and so forth. And as we were getting those questions about parts of the text that they weren't, they weren't getting when they were uh, re doing it, we already had this thing where we had like little post-its and, and notes in the margins, the marginalia, of uh, the characters from the Dresden Files like kind of kibitzing about the, the main text. Uh, alongside, the, it, it looks like a very marked up document, the Dresden Files role playing game. And we realized we had the perfect idiom for taking the questions that these people were asking and say, okay, well, Harry's the one who always asks the questions about the mechanics, so whatever that guy just over on the forum asked, Harry's going to ask it right here, and we're going to put the answer right next to it, and we're not actually going to have to reflow the text or anything like that. It's just going to be this extra little note off to the side so people can you know, experience the text one way, but then get kind of reinforcement, a different kind, a different kind of take on the same piece of information over to the side, and it kind of made a very thick book very approachable. So, you know, those two experiences under our belt, and then the rise of Kickstarter and role-playing games, we, we looked at that and went, well, this just seems like a natural fit for us to do essentially what we always did with our, uh, our pre-order processes, only in a, in a Kickstarter paradigm. And, well, how do we do that? That means that we're going to have to just be comfortable with people promising money and getting a look at the PDF. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's an extra step, because with the pre-orders before, you were, people were actually spending the money, and then we were sending the, PD, the, the PDF right away. Uh, this time, they are promising us money, and we're sending them the PDF right away. Luckily, most of them have seemed to want to stay around afterwards. Yeah, I was going to so, say, what's been the drop percentage, Fred? It, or has, has it been significant? It's been a handful. We're well north of 3,000 backers right now, and because I am a glutton for pain, while I filter and immediately read and archive all uh, of the, automatically, all of the messages that are people who are upgrading their pledge or newly pledging because that was a fire hose. I do not filter out people who cancel it because, you know, if, I, if there's suddenly droves of them, I want to be alert to it and, and say, oh, well, how do we, how do we misstep? So that means every now and then I get the little uh, punch in the gut of somebody, somebody, you know, dropping the project. But it can't have been more than, I don't know, one or two dozen by this point. Wow. That's a really small percentage. Yeah. You know, I, I expect to see some of that. Uh, you know, some people are going to drop but then re-pledge later. Some people are going to realize that they didn't have the money in December and they wanted to pledge in January when they know what their situation is more like. We're completely, you know, expecting that, especially with a long campaign time like, like we've got here. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to keep an eye on it. I, I basically want to look for worrying amounts of, of, of droppage, and that just hasn't been happening. Uh, on your other pre-launches, did you see the same type of success as you have now? I mean, right now, uh, Kick Tracks, I don't know if you've used that tool or not. I it do. tells you It has you trending right at a million dollars. Were yeah, you expecting well, that? Yeah, well, Kick Tracks uh, trending is always a lovely fantasy in the early, uh, <laughs> early you know, boom of the project. Uh, you get about halfway through your project, and it starts to look a little bit more like it. Uh, like a prediction. I mean, that's definitely part of the sport, watching a Kickstarter, right? We've run two Kickstarters before this, and we had those pre-orders in the time before Kickstarter really kind of became the, I don't know, the idiom. I would say that we have, in general, had a trend of expecting X amount of success and getting a face full of 3X. You know, it's... <laughs> Uh, Steve Kenson on Twitter said to me that he found it uh, essentially adorable that I underestimate the popularity of fate as much as I <laughs> uh, apparently tend to. But it's true. I mean, you know, I'm I'm always expecting. I'm fairly aware that we've got a lively fan community and that you know we've got some good love going for Evil Hat. But I'm still not expecting people to say, "Oh yeah, essentially sight unseen. We're we're going to promise you this large, you know." pile of cash. I'm hoping to, you know, pick them up after the product's out there and, and really demonstrating itself to people, but the early adopter factor that we experience is kind of crazy. So Spirit of the Century, you know, for the scale we were at at the time when we were expecting, okay, we might sell 100 copies in the pre-order and it sold many hundreds, that was astonishing to us at the time. That was really our first commercial taste of how popular Fate had gotten simply on the basis of the free stuff that we'd done prior to that. And, well, you know, Dresden was actually not shocking, but still a fire hose because it was 
the Dresden files. You know, having ridden shotgun on that fan community for years, I've got a nice chance to see how people always underestimate the volume of a Dresden files thing, and then it you know blows up on them. So I at least knew it was going to blow up on me, and that I was going to underestimate it. Yeah. <laughs> with our Kickstarters, we had done a fiction, something that launched essentially our fiction line uh, with the Dinocalypse trilogy. And that was one of those things where we had a $5,000 target to fund the second book in the trilogy. We knew that we were already going to do the first one anyway, so this was to see, okay, can we extend it beyond that? We hit that $5,000 goal in the first 16 hours and got to the $10,000 goal, which this is going to sound familiar, the $10,000 goal in 60 hours. Um, and that was funding the whole trilogy, at which point I already knew that I needed to be scrambling, talking to some of the other fiction uh, novel writing friends of mine that I... Uh, and contacts that I made, and said, "Okay, can we extend this? Can we can we now do some satellite novels that aren't written by uh, Chuck Wendig, who's writing the trilogy, but like chase after some of the other interesting characters of the uh, of, of the novel?" And that got us to a to funding a fiction line of seven books total when we were completely unproven as a uh, as a fiction publisher. And that was also one of those cases where we're like, okay, the, the moment the Kickstarter concludes, this time it wasn't you're, you're getting it in advance, the moment the Kickstarter concludes, you get at least the book in ebook form. Uh, so that gave us the, kind of the taste of the, ah, hair on fire uh, Kickstarter experience. Fate Core is dwarfing that experience because this is the first one that we've done that's really front and center in our core strength. The second one we did was Race to Adventure for a board game. And by the necessity of board games, they are expensive as all get out to produce. And their price point, so the entry point to actually buy a physical thing, tends to be a bit higher than a uh, role-playing game unless you're like doing a, a fairly small compact card game or something like that. Since we we're doing a full-on board game, our target was something like Forty thousand dollars, and we beat it. Uh, by the end, I think we ended up getting up to fifty-two, fifty-three, or something like that. But that was more tame compared to all of our other experiences in terms of that. But you know, the board game audience is very different, and I think in part because we put out such a huge monetary initial funding goal for it to even happen, I think a lot of people were just not as willing to race towards it. And that kind of together with the Dinocalypse experience, also informed the decision to make our initial funding goal on Fake Core fairly low because we're like, you know, this is, this is really a campaign that's uh, less about the product that we already know we're going to produce anyway and more about how much other cool stuff can we do along with it and make available to people. With each new digital expansion that comes out, people who buy in at $10 get them all. Uh, so that $10 tier has continued to be more and more valuable, which is very similar to what we did with the entry-level digital book tier for uh, the Dinocalypse trilogy. So we're, we, we're trying to, both from other people's Kickstarters and our own, um, or we're, we tried to build the best possible machine for uh, Kickstarter excitement uh, with Fate Core, and it, it might have worked. Fred, on the board game, talk a little bit about how you leveraged that after you were successful. Was that a product that has been successful away from crowdfunding? We're still in the process of getting it manufactured in Germany, so it's difficult for us to uh, measure its post-Kickstarter success. I can talk a little bit more about the novels because we did get the first one of uh, the Dinoclubs Dino now, uh, the first book, uh, uh, printed up already. I expect that unless you've got something strongly driving people to continue to discover whatever it is that you made through Kickstarter, uh, afterwards you can experience a pretty uh, sharp fall-off. I've also, in the past, teamed up with Daniel Solis, who kickstarted both Happy Birthday Robot and Doe Pilgrim's The Flying Temple, and then partnered with us at Evil Hat to do the actual physical publication of it. In both of their cases, you know, they got some, some solid excitement during the campaign, and they still sold okay afterwards, but they're not... If you looked at the Kickstarter and said, oh, well, this is how the sales performance is going to be throughout, you don't see that afterwards. And I don't know if we're going to see, have that kind of experience with Fake Core or not, it, because it is tied to a very strong community, and there may be people who are not uh, into fate now, but after the two months have passed and the book is out there, the enthusiastic friends will tell them, oh, you missed out on this great thing over here, but here's the book, it's cheap. I'm hoping that we will see a, a, at least a solid, steady carrier wave <laughs> keeps that going. Will we see that with our, our board game? I have, I have no idea. The board games and the novels are both tied into our Spirit of the Century setting. Uh, so 
all along they've been kind of a play to make sure that our Evil Hat's house setting, the the, the thing that we came up with ourselves and you know, didn't um, you know, have too many novels to base it on. It's about product breadth. It's about, you know, if people are into board games and they're into the role-playing game, a, a spread century role-playing game, a board game has a slightly stronger chance of, of grabbing their fancy. We're going to be doing a card game set in the uh, universe as well, but flipped around to the villain side of things, duking it out with Zeppelins in a kind of a deck builder, but a deck builder that you can fit in your pocket paradigm. Uh, that's going to be called Zeppelin Armada or something like Zeppelin Armada. I'm kind of rambling in, in response to your thing, but it's an interesting territory, and Kickstarter is still, I think, new enough that, uh, I mean, I, I've certainly heard a number of anecdotes of post-Kickstarter sales just not being uh, super there, but I also haven't personally taken a role-playing game that's in our core biggest audience um, out past the Kickstarter uh, before either, so we'll see. Being a Third project, a veteran of Kickstarter, what's the one thing you'd tell our audience that uh, could give them some help on their campaigns? Do not, do not look at Kickstarter as something that you do instead of a business plan. Your business plan cannot be, I have a project, yay Kickstarter! Why is nobody showing up? <laughs> That does not work, strangely enough. There's a lot of hard work that goes into a Kickstarter. You need to kind of look at it as a very short-term startup. It's a business, right? Uh, and you at least have to have some kind of business plan where you understand all of the costs you're going to experience in all sorts of scenarios. You look at huge success, mild success, and failure, and you have a good exit strategy for each of those. And you also need to come to terms with that's what one of the things behind the whole yay Kickstarter thing is that I think a lot of people who come to Kickstarter and don't have as good of an experience with it don't have as good of an experience with it because they didn't realize they had to build an audience before launching, right? I mean, Kickstarter does have some wonderful social media-like elements to it that uh, seriously aid discovery of a project that has some momentum, but to have some momentum in the first place, you have to kind of bring your, your crew with you, your, your early adopters, which we knew we had through our pre-order experiences. So, I mean, one of the jokes I've, I've heard in the folks who talk, uh, amongst the folks who talk Kickstarter online, is it's not so much Kickstarter as Kick Finisher. Be further along with your project, enough so that you've had something out there to talk about and get people excited, because you got to show up with an audience. We did. Great point. <laughs> Great point. Uh, Fred, tell us, how can our audience find you? Where do you want them to interact oh, with you everywhere. guys at? Everywhere. <laughs> He's uh, everywhere. I blog about publishing and other experiences on deadlyfriendly.com. It's spelled about how you'd expect. Uh, my company is at evilhat.com. Uh, just type fake core into the search engine at Kickstarter and you'll find our project. Great. Fred, thanks for spending some time with us this evening. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. This was fun. Thank you. Oh, well, that was fun. That poor woman over those darn geek. <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining us, boys and girls. If you want to help the boys with their show, please sign up for the VIP list. That way they can send you their free guide on how to crowdfund your project. Tune in next week as we learn more about how to reach your dreams through crowdfunding. Till then, remember, keep on dreaming and don't get tied down with any strings.